Um, I hope not too many of you tried to come here last week in the snow. And for those of you that are very interested in music, uh, Gary and Susan Jackson, we hope to get her in at the start of April during our regular Departmental Series, so probably the 12th of April that Thursday, um, if you want to put that in the calendars preliminarily. Um, anyway, today it gives me great pleasure to hand over straight away to Kiki Jenkins, the newest faculty member at the School of Marine and Environmental Affairs, to introduce today's speaker, Martin Pastures. So it's a great pleasure that I introduce Mark to us, to all of you. He's come quite a ways to talk to us today, all the way from the Netherlands. He's currently a project coordinator with the Center for Marine Policy, but in the past he served as director of that organization. And as we were talking a little bit earlier about his career path and how he came to that point, he said it traced all the way back to his time at the University of Amsterdam, where he studied theoretical ecology, but was also drawn to the philosophy of science and spent some time bouncing back and forth between those two seemingly disparate fields of study. Um, and what it brought him to, interestingly, in the middle was fisheries, because he said that was a place where science and policy met, the conflict and the clashing between the two. And he was very interested in how to get new forms of knowledge into that discourse. So he's been working with fisheries since 1997. He served as a chair of IC's advisory committee. Um, and <coughs> continued to work in uh, regional fishery management organizations throughout that time. So uh, today he's going to be talking to us about uh, the cautionary approach and participatory modeling as a way of addressing that clash of science policy in the fisheries arena and getting in new types of models. So, Martin. Thank you very much. Can you hear me like this? Um, I'm very glad to be here. It's a long flight, I must say. Uh, it's late in the night for me now. <laughs> Take too many lights off. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, breaking the paradigms of European fisheries management. Um, and in the introduction, you already heard that I've been uh, involved in fisheries advice for many years. Uh, my key interest is in in the role of knowledge in policy making. And indeed, I think fisheries is a, a particular fine topic to, uh, to look at that. Uh, before I want to start, start with my talk, I always like to get an impression of who is in the audience. So I'd like to do a small survey with you. Um, who in this audience are students? Are there any teachers in this audience? involved in policy making? Double roles? <laughs> ah, okay. Uh, research? Research is From Noah? And uh, fishers? Recreational fishers or also commercial fishermen? You sell them. Okay, that's good to know. Okay, uh, changing the paradigms. When I handed in the, the title of the talk, you, you never really know uh, what we're going to talk about and how the things are going to develop. So I was thinking that uh, there will be uh, lots of talks about changing the paradigm. In by the time I give the talk. It's not that far yet. Um, the word paradigm in itself is a bit of a funny word that you see from the point It doesn't really mean very much. And that's the way my title is as well. Uh, but it, I should have phrased it as a question instead of as a statement, I think. Because I'm not so sure that the paradigm is going to change. So maybe it's a question mark. But I'm going to look at it in two ways. One is in in a broader way about the fisheries policy in Europe. Uh, I'll talk about the common fisheries policy and see if there are going to be a change in the paradigm policy is going to be carried out. And in a more narrow way, uh, as a scientific paradigm, what sort of science is going to be used in underpinning the scientific policy of the future. So 
that's my ambition uh, for today. Uh, I have some more questions for you. Um, just to get an idea of what you know about European fisheries. Uh, let's see, the first one. Which fishery generates higher taxes? The European fishery or the US fishery? Who thinks it's uh, Europe? Raise your hands. Okay, and who thinks it's the US? Uh, and who don't, don't know? <laughs> That's not an option. <laughs> but it's, it's Europe, but they're very close. 5.1 million tons against 4.8. This is in 2007. But it hasn't been changed in 2010. There's a similar time. Uh, one more. <coughs> How many commercial fishing vessels do we have in Europe? Who thinks it's 30,000? 60,000? It's 90,000? Very well done. It's, uh, well, it's almost 90,000. 84,000 fishing vessels. But then there's over 80% of them are smaller than 12 meters. So there's lots of fishing vessels in the southern part of Europe, in Greece, in Italy, in Spain. Normally they are below 12 meters. And most of the regulations in Europe apply for fishing vessels larger than 12 meters. Uh, how many stocks do we make decisions on in Europe every year? 50, 100, 130. Who thinks 50? One. Who thinks 100? Two more. Who thinks 130? Yes. It's the 130, but I think it's even a bit more than that. This is the fish stocks in, in the European waters that we get decisions. And finally, is uh, European fish management leading to sustainable fisheries? Very factual statement. Here I have a don't know. So who thinks it's a yes? <laughs> There's probably a lot of don't know. Is it a no? And who don't know? I don't have the answer to this one. <laughs> Maybe you know by the end. Uh, but it is something that is uh, quite obvious from, from the press. The reputation of the fisheries policy in Europe is not a very good one. Uh, and this is a quote from the Commission itself, when they say uh, basically they have failed in European fishing management. And, uh, but you see that in a lot of uh, press, uh, also in the the uh, newspapers, uh, it's, it's always a repetition of the same idea that fish meat management has failed. And normally there's a, also a story with good guys and bad guys, and the good guys are normally the scientists, and the bad guys are normally the policy makers and the fishermen. So the policy makers because they set the quota too high, and the fishermen because they're always cheap. So that's the overall story. Uh, but but for example, this idea that the quota are always set higher than the scientific advice, uh, there's been a couple of papers on that topic. I, I participated in one of those papers. Uh, but I, I came across another analysis recently where they looked at what is the direction of the advice. Are they advising an increase or a decrease? And what is the direction of the change in the, in the total of our text, the TAC? And they found that there was quite a, quite a similar pattern, although the, the signal was different. <coughs> Scientists tended to advise increases, dramatic increases, and the tendency of the reaction was a sort of delayed response. So if, if the advice was for a reduction in quota of 30%, then maybe it would be an 18% reduction in TAC. So it's not all, it's not all um, Well, you get challenges, you get these uh, bad press, but there's also quite a bit of bad press about the science, especially from the fishing. Uh, I could have put in a lot of pictures from the newspapers. Uh, and the thing is that uh, the fishermen that are responding to the 
science are often um, making claims that are, the science is too close to the policy, so they don't trust the credibility of the science. Uh, and also the perceptions don't match. So the science provides a sort of overall estimate of the size of the stock. And for example, a concept like spawning of biomass to many of the fishermen that go out at sea doesn't really mean very much because it's, it's too abstract. They can't, they can't visualize 300,000 tons of fish. They can visualize what they can catch and whether they can catch more this year than last year. But they can't visualize these big numbers. Um, but I think it's also important to, think, to realize that in their perception, quite often, they see the science as being very close to the policy. So they, they distrust the science in that sense. OK. The common fisheries policy is the, the policy in Europe about fisheries management. It's a, a policy that is for 10 years, and the new policy will start in 2030. So we are now in the process of, um, in Europe, we are in the process of preparing the change. Um, this started with a green paper from the European Commission. I will talk about these institutions. Uh, in 2009, which is a sort of basic analysis of where we are and where we should go. And then, with all the 27 member states of Europe, we're in this negotiation process of renewing the policy. Um, and the question that I wanted to, to raise in this talk is, will that change in the common fisheries policy also be a change in the paradigms behind the fisheries policy in Europe? Um, will it, for example, change the role of stakeholders in fisheries management? Will it introduce ITQs, individual transferable quota, as a management tool? Uh, we are talking about introducing a ban on discarding. Um, we are talking about introducing regional management uh, organizations. So there are a number of things happening that could lead to a change in the um, and I'm also very interested in will this also have an impact on the science that is used to uh, underpin the policy or to inform the policy making. So will the science be as close as to policy as it is now? Will there be a more open way of producing the science, more open to observers, more open to uh, a different type of knowledge? That's a few of the things that I want to explore <coughs> in this talk. Uh, two main things that I will talk about. One is the context and content of the European Fisheries Management System. Uh, and uh, I will talk about the main management instruments like TACs, but also the, the technical regulations that exist. Uh, I will talk about something, a concept that I really like in thinking about this system that's the TAC machine. I'll introduce you to that concept. And also introduce you to concepts about um, normal science and post-normal science. So what is the type of knowledge that is being generated for policy making? In the second bit of my talk, I will focus specifically on participatory knowledge and more specifically on participatory modeling as a tool to uh, involve stakeholders and scientists in a joint process for knowledge development and developing of long-term management plans. And this is based on a, on a project that I've been involved in over the last few years. Um, overall, as I said, my focus is very much on the role of knowledge in policy making. And to me, fisheries policy is a wonderful candidate for that. Because it's, it's, it's a relatively small area, but it's, you find all the debates and the, and the issues with uh, uh, certifying what type of knowledge is being used to make decisions of. And then it's economically in Europe, well, there's a lot of catches generated in the fisheries, but economically it's a very, very small sector. Less than 1% of the economic. Se uh, sectors in Europe, and I presume it's probably the 
same in the US. OK, so fictions management in Europe. The objective of fictions management in Europe is to promote sustainability in ecological, economic, and social settings. That's uh, the big objective of the, the policy. Um, and the question is, is that delivering any paper that you read on the ecological sustainability is normally not so positive. Uh, you don't read many papers on the economic or social sustainability. Uh, there's just not many papers coming out on that. And, and in fact, all of the debates that you see going on on the European fisheries are on the ecological side of the policy. I will talk a bit about the type of measures that are in this policy. I will talk about the role of science. I will briefly talk about the outcomes of the policy. In my mind, and I think I'm not the only one, that the common fisheries policy is very much top down control policy. Everything is written down in these big documents, very, very detailed. I thought of bringing one of these excerpts from the technical regulations which specify how you should repair your net, with what type of uh, sewing technique, and how you should then attach the new part of the net to the old part. And it's all described in the regulation. It's amazing. So the, the idea is that we can specify the rules on how the fishermen should operate when they're It's really top down. And that's the one version of trying to control uh, fishes. The other is looking at, as, at fishes as a sort of uh, commons, people that are governing their own um, resources. So the European choice is very much control uh, strategy. Which, which then has to impose all the rules on it. <coughs> so if you go for the control strategy, then, then the fishes are sort of subjects, things to be regulated. So we have a lot of rules, and that's the way they try to operate. The main intervention tool in Europe is TACs, I think you call them differently here, you call them total allowable catch. That's the amount of the weight of the fish that you're allowed to bring ashore uh, for a certain species in a certain area for a stock. That's the main intervention tool in most of Europe, except in the Mediterranean. Uh, that's where they have all these small vessels. There we don't have TAC, there we have only technical measures and some network restrictions. Um, the key thing in these TACs is that it it's a political instrument. And when this policy started in the 19, early 1980s, um, there was an initial distribution of these TACs over the different member states. With, this was based on the historical catch rates. So this was then called the relative stability. So every country had a fixed share of the TAC of a species in a certain area. No one can touch that relative stability. So it's a very political instrument. It's the way we split up the resource among countries. In practice, it doesn't mean so much anymore because the companies are now finding ways around it. So, for example, the Dutch fishermen own most of the fleet in the UK, so they can fish on the UK coast. So that it's it's a sort of historical uh, development that we are maintaining, uh, and it is because of political reasons that we can't change it. Um, there's a few other regulations. Apart from the TAC, we see now also uh, some effort regulations in some fisheries. Uh, there are very many technical regulations, I'll come back to that. And there's also this issue of um, subsidies, the European Fisheries Fund. So there is the which has, of course, a long tradition of debatable support to fishing industries for first uh, improving their vessel and then getting a subsidy for decommissioning that vessel. 
So there's still a few of these things happening. Um, but on the technical side, I think this example from a colleague, uh, Paul Demo, who's now the, who made an interesting career because he was first research director, then he went to work at the European Commission, and now he's working at ISIS, the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea. Um, he's been in all positions, and he, uh, he gave this uh, slide a couple of years ago when he did a keynote on, on how we do technical regulations here. Now, if you are regulating speed in traffic, you just say, well, that's the maximum speed. You're not allowed to go fast. If you would do this in fisheries, you would have a long sign. Which would describe if you have if you have this type of car, <laughs> then you have to do all these special things. That's how we regulate technical how we describe it. <laughs> and it's it's, uh, it's it's getting thicker and thicker every year. So every revision is an addition. There's never a, something which is crossed out in Europe. And a very interesting example is the, the mesh regulations in Europe. It started with uh, setting them the minimum mesh size in the collect or catching the fish. Uh, and then the fisherman uh, said, okay, if, if this is the minimum mesh size, we'll, we'll use thicker twines. So, ah, then we'll put in a regulation for thicker twines. Ah, I said, they will change the material for the, that the twines are made from. Ah, they will make a regulation for the material that the twines are made from. So there's this sort of almost cat and mouse play going on in these technical regulations, which means that they get thicker. Okay, um, I'm now going to show you the decision making system in Europe. Hold on. <laughs> It's not so difficult if you know the way you are. I, I have some colors to make it a bit easier. So here we have the blue colors. That's the European Union. In the European Union, we have three main institutions, or three uh, that are dealing with fisheries management. We have the European Commission, which is represented by the Director General Maritime Affairs, DTMAR. Um, those are civil servants, and they have a commissioner, which is their sort of head civil servant. That's now Mrs. Daminaki in Honda. They are the civil servants, so they prepare all the problems. Then we have the Council of Ministers. That's the um, assembly of all the ministers of fisheries of the European member states. 27 ministers of fisheries or agriculture. They are the decision-making sort. They make the final decision. And then we have the European Parliament, which is voted by every member, every European. And they have a co-decision authority with the ministers nowadays. I don't know how this is going to work. We don't have many experiences yet with for example, what happens if the parliament doesn't agree with the decision of the ministers? I don't know. You have two democratic bodies fighting each other more or less. Uh, but we'll, we'll see how that works. The most um, vocal player in fisheries management in Europe is the European Commission. They are the sort of central player because they, they, they deal with the science, they deal with the proposals, they deal with the Negotiations, and the only thing that they can't deal with is the decision making. Uh, what more do we have here? Ah, the science. Yes. We have uh, national fisheries institutes um, collecting data both from the fishing fleets and from the surveys. They provide experts and information on data to ISIS, the International Council for the Exploration of the Seas. Are you familiar with that? Um, and they provide advice to the European Union and to some other clients like the uh, North East Atlantic Fisheries Commission, a couple of other commissions. 
Um, there's also the Scientific and Technical Economic Committee on Fisheries, which is part of the European Union, uh, so directly funded from, from the European Commission. Uh, and they are the sort of uh, house scientists, in house scientists at the Commission. But they are the same scientists as in ISIS, but they just get called to another degree. And they do more technical type of science. So in ISIS, it's, it's restricted, formally restricted, to ecological fisheries type advice. So ISIS is not supposed to talk about economic consequences or social consequences. Just the ecological sustainability and uh, SDCF, the European Union scientists, they are also talking about economics and technical stuff. Okay, so the European Commission sets out questions to ISIS, to the CCF, gets back answers and uh, proceeds with proposals. Then we have the uh, regional advisory councils, stakeholder body uh, introduced in the in the latest reform of the common fisheries policy in 2002. It's a combination of fishers and NGOs, and they are, are tasked to provide advice to the European Commission about intended measures. And there's also another name that I'll protect. Um, in practice, there is a fixed allocation of seats in these regional advisory councils. And, um, and in practice, because of funding and stuff like that, it's mostly there's one more. Uh, I have one more. Okay, so the decision making takes place in the Council of Ministers. This is one of the pictures. This is not the normal place where they meet. This is some particular arrangement they have, probably for signing a treaty or so. Um, but it is, it is like this that they're all sitting around the table, 27 of them, talking about uh, 130 stocks every year. I think it's a quite, a, quite an event. Normally it takes until um, uh, deep in the night to find the uh, conclusion. <coughs> and uh, nobody can see this. So this is uh, completely in a black box. Um, and that has a sort of disadvantage in that it, the decisions that come out of this system are not often considered very uh, or the NGOs often complain that it's the fisheries ministers and they are too close to the fisheries and they are always trying to raise the quota so that the fishermen are happy. And the fishermen are complaining that they are listening too much to the NGOs and the quota are too low, too high, stocks are better, etc. Nobody knows what the real reasons are for the decision because that's not in the communication. Um, so, um, that's the Council of Ministers and the, the regional advisory councils, a bit more of that. Um, the role of these councils is that they provide advice to the European Commission. The thing with advice is, of course, what happens when you get the advice. And there's not a clear relation yet between the advice that is provided by the by the regional advisory councils and the actions taken by the European Commission. Because the, the European Commission is sort of free to, to use all the information that they get from the scientists, from the stakeholders, and then make a proposal. Um, prior to these uh, regional advisory councils, there was just individual lobbying between stakeholders in Europe. So they would sit in the corridors uh, where the ministers would meet and they would just try to grab them when they come out of the room and say, have you make sure that the quota for the species are okay. Um, but what you can see from this uh, graph, I thought I should have a graph in my presentation, uh, is that the number of advices from the regional advising council is increasing, which is not so strange because they only started operation in uh, before. So they just have to find their feet. But when you talk to the people in these commissions, they are often quite unsure what 
they're both they're using these advices, but what really happens with them? And I, I spoke to one of them, to one of them, and they, he said, well, we, we gave advice, and then the commission says, we will only follow up the advice if it, if it leads to sustainable fisheries. Yeah. <laughs> but what is sustainable fisheries? Would, would that be the question? Well, that's, if they don't follow up the advice, then that would have led, not led to sustainable fisheries. That's the answer. <laughs> okay, we got the science in uh, fisheries policy. Uh, this, in the in the documentation of the fisheries policy, it, you have this economic, social, and ecological sustainability, and informed by the best available science. So it's a science-based policy. And the main uh, providers, as I said, are ISIS, the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea. Uh, where I used to work as a chair of the advisory committee on fishery management, and the scientific and technical economic committee on fisheries. Uh, but the definition of what is science in this context is mostly natural science. Because I think if you would say this in, uh, in money terms, I think 95% of the advice in the funding is for natural science. Um, and one thing that, that I think is very interesting when we come to reflect on this policy is that there is very, very little research in the behavior of fishers. So we are producing advice on, on quota and, and stuff like that uh, in the assumption that if you then implement that quota, then that will just happen. You set the quota and the fishers will change their strategy to fish in that quota. And the practice has shown that that, that never happens. So you cut the quota from caught in the North Sea, and suddenly you have lots of fishermen fishing for networks. Ha! Huh. We never thought about that. So now we have to put in additional measures for networks. Uh, but this thinking in terms of strategies of uh, the fishers responding to management measures is not part of the scientific enterprise. And I think it would be a very interesting how do how we relate response to measures to the measures that are taken? That's enough. Okay, what is this science in ISIS? Um, well, as a, as a personal story, when I started in this advisory process back in probably 2000 or so, this was a really close process. So here we are. In this meeting room, we are not 27, we were 20, 20 members. And in, in, during the meeting, we were not allowed to communicate with outside experts. And there were no outside people in that room. So we were just between each other, and we were supposed to come up with the advice. Um, and the, the reason behind this is that we were supposed not to be influenced by outside uh, interest. So you couldn't speak to stakeholder organizations, you couldn't speak to policy makers, you couldn't speak to other scientists. Um, and we also had no observers in that process except from the European Commission. There was an observer from the European Commission uh, observing the uh, advisory process. Um, and the reason is, I, I have a small quote that I took from the ISIS paper. The sole reason for ISIS to make scientific information more accessible to a wider public is to provide an unbiased scientific basis for public opinion and policy. So this, this idea that you if you separate the people in a room and you keep them away from all the influences from the outside world, you will get a, a more a better and a more objective advice. And that's what I call the normal science model. So it's a way of thinking about science as um, trying to provide the objective truth, trying to provide uh, completely independent advice. Um, it's also a sort of puzzle solving. It's you know what the techniques are, you just keep filling the, the numbers and you will get out the, the right answers. 
And this, this model is very, very strong in, in the European system. And it's also a way of dividing uh, tasks. So you have scientists that produce the truth, and you have policy makers that make the decisions. But that's the sort of model that is behind it. And you see in a lot of the publications that it's stressed over and over again that it needs to be independent and objective science. Natural science, of course. Um, I'll, I'll contrast that in a little bit later. Uh, now, suppose that you spend a lot of money on that science. So you don't get, well, you can get more information from the science. This is a bit of a tricky uh, graph. There's quite a lot of graphs in my presentation. Maybe this is quite easy. <laughs> so, the blue line here is the, the budget in the European Union for fishing science, specifically at aimed at advice. Uh, that increases from about 25 to 40 million euros per year. We have this fantastic data collection framework. We spend lots of money on sampling all kinds of stuff. Uh, and the red line is the number of stocks where we don't know how they are. We can't assess the state of the stocks. Uh, and it's a bit of a tricky uh, graph. I accept that. There is no direct relation, and of course, if you invest in research, you can only expect results a bit later. But the key thing is that you can invest as much money as you want in all kinds of sampling. If you're sampling the wrong things, you will not get more information. So if, if the science system, which is driving the advice, is, doesn't have the, the sort of support in, uh, in the whole management system, that generates um, opportunities to do uh, good sampling. What happens if you don't get access to catches in a harbor, or when some fisheries will not be sampled? That's feasible in Europe. That's possible. Maybe, maybe I don't know what it's here, but we have that uh, situation. So when the when the credibility of the science is challenged. Um, and fishers are looking for other ways around the management measures, one of the things would be to uh, frustrate the scientific advice system by not delivering uh, data, or by delivering data for something which is not really happening, inventing catches or things like that. So, uh, maybe another one. Uh, this, is the, this is less big. So this is an overview of how many stocks in Europe do we provide advice on and, and for which one can we provide a numerical forecast, it's the blue line, which stocks can we provide at least some scientific advice, so if you catch 10,000 tons last year, maybe the scientific advice is 10,000 tons next year, that would be, or a bit less, and for which stocks do we not have any scientific advice. Well, there is a little bit of a trend, maybe, but not very much. And you can see that uh, um, most of the advice is on stocks where we don't really know what is happening. It's quite a lot. Okay, yes, then I get to the TAC machine. I really like this concept. This uh, was introduced by some colleagues I worked with in. Uh, Earlier project, Petabon and uh, I can't pronounce this first name, Nielsen, guy from Denmark. Um, and it's, uh, it's trying to define the process of uh, generating information for TAC. And they came up with this metaphor of the TAC machine. This is a picture from a, uh, an installation from Young TV. I don't know whether you've ever been to Basel. If you, if you ever come there, go to this machine, this is really fantastic. You can sit one whole day in front of this thing. Because you will discover new things every time. Everything is moving in this. So it, it is a bit like the European Union. <laughs> I used to think before. Uh, their idea of a TSC machine is there is a benefit in producing TSCs, both for the scientists and for the policy makers. 
I have these pictures which are assembled in stocks. Uh, and uh, you generate information from it and you, you put that into the signs, which will then produce forecasts. Uh, I, I labeled it here as BP8, the Holman uh, News, and they always talk about virtual population analysis, but it is a stock assessment. An assessment of how many fish there are. And if you can make a forecast, you can say, well, if you catch this, then that will happen. That's ideal. Then you give that to the policy makers, and the policy makers, they can generate the TAC, and the fish can be adhered to the TAC. So there's a sort of mutual benefit because uh, it provides a very clear separation between science and policy. And if both generate legitimacy for them. So scientists say, well, we just provide you with the objective forecast, and the uh, policy makes that task. This is the information we got from the science. Uh, the thing is that this system tends to break down when it is really needed. So for Nossi Court, for example, maybe you heard of that uh, a couple of years ago, it's not in so good situation. Um, and the information base started to deteriorate. There were black landings. We didn't really know what the size of the stock was. We, we knew it was small, but we couldn't produce an assessment anymore. So when the stock is going down, the information base is very low, and we, we can't use this machine anymore because the scientists said we, we can't make a forecast anymore. Uh, the other thing is that if you have imprecise assessments, you can, you can uh, end up with an estimate which is an underestimate of a or an overestimate, uh, which then results in normally in lower quota, uh, which results in underreporting or changing in reporting, which then re generates another sort of vicious circle of decreasing. Uh, Quality. Uh, what I say is, stock assessment cannot give very precise results, and the management system is very vulnerable <coughs> when these predictions fail. And these predictions always fail. That's, that's what's happening all the time. Okay. The TSC machine is a way of mutually reinforcing the uh, the use of the TSC as the, the TSC and the stock assessment as the key cornerstone of fisheries management. And this is not just in Europe. I think this is happening in many, many places. Uh, it may, it, the consequence is that you always have to think about fisheries in terms of stocks. That's the unit, because that's the unit in the assessment. And that's the unit in the TSC. And sometimes not a stock, but that's not the, the main issue. But it, it forces you to think about in aggregated units, not in local batches, not in, uh, for example, court. It's an interesting example. They, they are not migrating very far. So you can very easily think of a management system which is taking into account regional distributions of certain, uh, certain groups of that animal. But this, this system, promoting that we think of fisheries management in terms of stocks. Uh, how am I doing with time? Not so good. <laughs> I'll still tell you all the time. Hmm. I'll just finish my first talk. I'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> I can do another talk tomorrow. <laughs> Is the room available tomorrow? I'll just uh, finish it. Uh, no. no Post normal science. Um, it's another way of thinking about the science process. Um, derived from a uh, social scientist. And they say, well, if you have a system where there's a lot of uncertainty and high stakes, and you need to make a decision, you don't talk about the sort of objective independent size, 
you need to think about involving a broader group of stakeholders in your in evaluating your science product. And they call that the extended period. But for normal science, we have the peer review process that you have in uh, scientific journals. They say for this particular type of post normal science, you should think about involving a broader group of people, not just looking at the scientific criteria, but also how useful is that science for this purpose. And I think if you if you look at the developments in ISIS over the past 10 years, you can see that these type of concerns are being implemented. So we now have observers in the scientific process. Um, we have uh, involved uh, stakeholders in the uh, basic formulation of the methodologies for many of the stocks. So it is opening up in that sense. But it's still a sort of preliminary uh, steps. Okay, I'll move over a bit quicker. A bit on the outcome of the management. I'll talk about the yardstick, how do you measure this? I'll talk about um, is there an over exploitation? And I'll talk about evaluation and then I'll probably skip the participatory just a second. I never know I just don't so long. Okay, the yardstick. <laughs> It's so difficult to make presentations. Right? If you think of all these uh, precautions, the yardstick is precaution. In Europe, we have the, the precautionary approach from fishery management. We have that here as well. A particular type of uh, implementation. Um, that's one of the papers that I'm uh, writing at the moment on how this got established. That's another fascinating uh, story about how the division between science and policy is not arranged. Because precautionary approach is, in, in a sense, is a political agreement. Uh, but ISIS was asked to provide uh, technical implementation. So what did we come up with? We came up with two types of reference points, uh, measuring devices, yardsticks, uh, limit reference points, and precautionary reference points. Limit reference points were for science. Precautionary reference points were for policy. So that there was a clear definition of roles. Uh, in practice, the, both of these reference points were set by scientists because the policymakers never responded to the request to provide precautionary reference points. Uh, but, but in a sense, these reference points are the sort of yardstick that are uh, embedded in the fisheries policy in Europe. Um, and funnily enough, money compared to other areas, maximum sustainable yield was not part of it. Something in our vocabulary at that. Until, until the green paper from the Commission came out on the reform of the commission policy. Then suddenly we, we got this number. It's 88%. And I'm fascinated by the 88%. 88% of the European fish stocks are overfished. Is the statement in the green paper. You find that everywhere now. If you look at NGOs, at uh, newspapers, at Time magazine, anyone will say European fisheries, 88% is overfished. Okay, so I'm going to look at what is this 88%. First of all, it's against MSY, which is not in the policy. This is a new new thing, new yard set. Thirty thirty-three stocks uh, they looked at, and of those thirty-three stocks, four were fished below FMS one. So that's eighty percent. And that's all the other stocks where we have no information. But the, the, the it's it's fascinating to see how effect gets created by just repeating the number. So everyone will say 88%. And, and this is of course something that, that is changing by year because of all the differences in estimation and uh, <coughs> assessment or not. Um, so, yes. It's fascinating. But the, the, the key thing to, to this on this, to me, is that at the end of the policy, the 
10 year policy, common fisheries policy, there's suddenly a new, new measuring device which is introduced to argue why the policy needs changing. Um, now, I know that MSY is a discussion that is everywhere with, after the Johannesburg agreement, but it's funny that you set up a policy, you define objectives, and then you measure the policy against something completely different in a way which is not accessible to the public. So there's this green paper coming out, out of the air, almost, and nobody knows what the analysis behind this. The 88%, um, I have some contacts in the European Commission. So that's how I know how this calculate. But if you have no context, you, you can't know how this number came about. And my argument is that a key failure in the common fisheries policy well, there are some failures with regard to fisheries management, but the key failure is a lack of evaluation. There is no formal evaluation of what the policy tried to do and what it achieved. And I looked at a, a very thick document on evaluating how much money we spent on different things. But the only thing that's not in the document is, did we achieve the objective that we set in this policy? And especially it's not available to the public. But that's something Okay, I'm, I have lots of slides on participatory modeling. It's very interesting. I'll, I'll very shortly tell you the, the main things from it before I round up. Um, we did a number of case studies where we tried to um, engage with stakeholders to develop uh, long-term management plans. And we had two examples that I was going to talk about. One is uh, on the herring stock in the uh, Stegar, uh, somewhere around the North Sea. Um, and that's a case where the, the stakeholders involved were very informed already, had already participated in these type of processes, were almost operating like scientists. And there it worked very, very smooth. So we ended up with a management plan that we co constructed between science and stakeholders. I don't know what happened after because they have not made a decision yet. The other case is more or less the opposite, where there was no agreed methodology, where there was no um, sort of talking platform existing already, um, and where the scientists were trying to look for a methodological approach and the stakeholders wanted to just have some text to su support their ideas on management like we don't want new fishers to come into our fishery. And there was there was just no connection. So we have two examples. One of a very successful approach using this uh, participatory modeling where we generated new type of results and another example where we basically failed because there was no connection from the beginning. Now I had lots of other interesting stuff to talk about there, but that's about it. But I want to show you the, the final thing. I'm going to go down now. Well, more graphs. Ah, yeah, yeah, So, will this new common fisheries policy call for a new policy orientation? Will it change the paradigm? I'm not so sure. Um, this uh, European system is a very, very difficult system for decision making. If you think that the US is difficult, think everything is triple compared to the European Union. Um, so I, I'm not sure what is coming out. Uh, in this case, the, there's quite a division between member states. We have the, some member states that want to keep the current set up because they are profiting from it more, others want to change. Um, it's very unclear at this stage what will happen. Um, I think it is likely that there will be some sort of a discard ban introduced in the new policy. And it's also likely that there will be something on individual transferable quota. But what that will be and, and how effective that is going to be, to me it's uh, I'm not going 
holding here that this is going to solve the issue. Um, so they are talking still about some new steering mechanisms, but um, from the talks I had recently, I think that it's unlikely that this will materialize. So there's been talk about regional orientation, there's been talk about um, different governance models. Um, but it's, 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 it seems like it's sort of stagnating a bit. very nice to end with. Um, and perhaps this is part of the, the reason that this the TSC machine is much stronger than we anticipated. Or maybe, maybe you can't say that. I think it is clear that the TSC machine is a very, very strong mechanism in the universe. And any attempt to come up with new types of solutions are sort of rated against how does it does it affect relative stability and how does it affect the if you think of for regional management or close areas, they are very difficult to match up with these PSCs. Uh, and, and this is keeping also in place the division between science and policy. Um, participatory knowledge and voting and change data. I am very convinced that we are looking for uh, new types of information. But I'm not sure that it's going to be effective in the common business policy that is coming up now. Uh, I'm, I, I'm personally very much in uh, uh, developing that type of thinking, looking for new ways of measuring, new ways of expressing what is happening in the city, uh, using different sources of information, not just the uh, stock, but also looking at spatial distribution, looking at length distribution at where juveniles are, where uh, reproduction occurs. But I'm not really sure that this is going to be effective in the policy yet. Um, and in terms of this participatory modeling, I should have said that in my conclusion, um, what you see is that it, it seems to work when stakeholders take part in the normal science process. If they accept the scientific methods using the stock challenge I see is, can we find ways to involve the stakeholder way of thinking in these type of approaches? Can you think about spatial closures? Can you think about temporal closures? Can you think about specific mesh uh, regulations that they want to do? And how, that's uh, to me a real scientific challenge, how you can uh, take that into account when you develop management That's sort of paradigm shift. One, one final statement from a very good colleague of mine. Uh, if you ever want to read a book about fisheries management in Europe, read this book, The Paradoxes of Transparency. It's a fantastic book. Uh, and he, he, this quote, I really use a lot. Scientists are transparency experts. Scientists are transparency experts. So when I was working in, in in ISIS in the beginning of the 2000s, and I was not allowed to communicate with outside. I was basically not allowed to share the methodologies and the, and the assumptions. And he says, well, the key thing with science is that you should be transparent. That you should always be able to explain how you know what you say. And with that, I would like to go.
European policies, and one is dealing with agriculture, and the other is dealing with fisheries. The, those are the only two policies where the European Union is the deciding body. All the other policies, the member states of Europe, are the deciding authority. So there are not very, there are not many similar cases, but uh, there is a common agricultural policy, which is dealing somewhat with the same issues, but it's much broader. It deals with all kinds of crops uh, and, uh, and glass houses and uh, all different type of uh, stuff. But I'm, I'm not. I know that there is a similar change process going on. <coughs> I would say that the other policies, like the environmental policy or the, uh, the policy we now have on uh, uh, biodiversity, they are they are so different because it's a member state responsibility, and there's many many challenges with that. Uh, but it is the, the big difference is that in the fisheries, European Union can say this is going to be the matter, and the other policies. They say to the member states, you should implement a management for this. Uh, and then you do it. But we have this example now with the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, which is the uh, environmental pillar for the sea management. And this is uh, looking at achieving good ecological status in the seas of Europe by 2020. Uh, but it's it's uh, directed at member states. So for the North Sea, you have seven member states around the North Sea. And each of them is going to set good ecological status for the North Sea, for their part of the North Sea. So maybe that you end up with, maybe the southern part of the North Sea is measuring a different type of good ecological status than the other one. And there is, uh, in this policy, a request to harmonize. But there is not a, a way to do it. There's no authority. So in that sense, it's, it's very different from all the policies. Yes. So my understanding, I might be completely wrong, is that as the European Union is expanding, that for, so there are more member countries that are seeing a shift to um, majority decision making, where so some decisions that in the past have had single country veto are now going to move to majority decision making. So I was just wondering, is that likely to have an effect on I'm not sure that it's going to have a big impact because there is no, I don't think there's ever been a veto used in fisheries policy making. They, they sort of negotiate until they fall asleep <laughs> and then they have a decision. So, so I don't think it happens in the fisheries policy making. It will happen in the the more political issues on, on treaties and, uh, and stuff like that. But, uh, I don't think it will apply in the treaties. Yeah, um, you, a lot of what you've said is what I, refers to, from what I understand of ICs and um, Europe generally, is the sort of northern empire of BPAs and XSAs and uh, TACs and FLRs. And um, to what extent are you seeing change in the southern part of? Europe, where none of that has much of a history. I mean, we don't think of EPAs on species in, in the Mediterranean. In fact, if I think of the Mediterranean, I think of a disaster area. Um, what do you think is going to happen in that part of, of, of Europe? Are, are you seeing participatory processes developing there? I mean, I've seen the, the rat processes and, and what's been going on in the North Sea, and, and this, I can never pronounce it, Skatigan, or however you pronounce it. Um, what, what's going on in Southern Europe and how does, how does the ch change in policy likely to affect that part? Uh, I don't think I can answer the second bit of your question. But the first bit is what is going on. Uh, this, this talk is about the northern part of Europe. This is where the stock assessments and the TACs are in operation. Uh, I think it would be interesting to look at the Mediterranean with the same view. See, how it is, what is happening there. There is now a, a regional advisory council for the Mediterranean in, I don't know whether it's in, in operation already, but 
be more or less. Uh, but I'm not really sure what they will be doing. Um, there is the sort of information on a Mediterranean scale is, is very uh, scanty. Uh, it's in terms of policy making, it's a it's a very difficult area because you have half European members and half African and uh, and other members, um, and there is not even a agreed border between the two. There's no EZ in the Mediterranean. Um, so it would be nice to have a look at this. It's a uh, good point. I'll take that on board. When I was uh, in the advisory process in ISIS, we would spend hours negotiating the text for the advice, which would produce then, uh, say, uh, 10 pages on one single stock. And then everybody would leave. And I, as the chair of the committee, I was then writing a press release, which is, of course, the most crucial thing. Uh, but nobody argued about what should be in the press release. So the, the, the handling of, and to me it's, it's a very important thing, how you translate, when you, you go from, from a scientific expert group to an advisory group to a press release and to an interview with the journalist, and, and there can be a complete disconnect between the two. Because I, I, when I first did this, I sort of got a phone call from a journalist and he said, what is the main thing from your advice? And I said, oh, well, it's, it's about the uh, North Sea coast. Ah. So I talked about North Sea coast. All the, all, the, all the interviews that came after were all about North Sea coast because this got picked up. So the, but it's surprising to see that an advisory process like that is so much focused on the content that there is no attention to how you then distill the, the key message. And that was in. I sort of stopped this work in 2008, and since then there's been a, a move towards uh, summarizing the advice in a few lines, so that is what you can then communicate. Uh, so, very important, and in the past has not been part of the process. Final question? Yes, it is taken into account in the technical regulations, um, but there's no direct link between the TSC and the, and the way it is done. So that there are different regulations, um, and the TSC regulates how many fish you can bring ashore, and the technical re regulations regulate how you can fish with what kind of DA in what type of area. But there's no link between the two in the sense that they said, well, we have a TAC of so much, and you can fish that percent with that gear, and that is not part of the uh, policy at the moment. And I'm not sure whether that is going. I, I don't think it's likely that that will change. Uh, but it is likely that there, is, there will be a, uh, a change because of other policies, because we now have uh, in different areas Marine protected areas in, uh, in the process of being established, and in those areas there will be a, a closed area in these protected areas, but there will also be an area where you can fish with certain types of friendly gear, special gear. So, in, in that sense, that will then uh, <coughs> come up in, in, in those books. Right. Well, thank you very much.